They say that birds of a feather flock together. Yet Jesus of Nazareth was unquestionably a friend of sinners and a critic of saints. He seemed more comfortable with the so-called bad people of his time than with the so-called good people of his time. Does that mean he was soft on sin? Is sin just a hangover from the Stone Age? Almost, but not quite eradicated from the human sea. It is written. This is George Vanderman. Today, It Is Written presents Stone Age Hangover. There was a time when sin was sin and crime was crime. There was a time when lawbreakers were punished not by probation or parole, but by simply throwing stones at the offender until he died. The Stone Age, you see. But our sophisticated generation has come a long way from that. For decades now, we've been trying to rid the world of sin, not by a campaign to change either the hearts or the conduct of men, you understand, but by changing our definitions and our vocabulary. Sin today is widely considered only a superstition from the early days, a superstition that is not quite faded out yet. Certain ministers are speaking of what our fathers called sin. Our fathers were not enlightened, we say, but we, their more educated offspring, have taken the matter in hand. We've decided that alcoholism is only a disease even though not a single case has yet been discovered that could be traced, that could not be traced directly to alcohol. As for drug, addict, drug addicts, we all know that they're hooked with no power to break the chemical chains that bind them. When crime increases, we blame it to poverty and joblessness, not to choice. We're even toying with the idea that a murderer may be simply the innocent victim of an irresistible impulse? Imagine. This idea that people do what they do because they're either sick or well, and not because they're bad or good, is given all the respect due to a scientific breakthrough. We like to think of what we do as nothing to do with our character or with our choice. Cyrus Montgomery, writing with tongue only partially in cheek, suggests that we ought to have categories of sickness. People who robbed banks or committed murder or were guilty of treason would probably be considered bad sick, probably eligible for the intensive care ward. Medium sick might be uh, arson, uh, robberies of more than $100 but less than $10,000 and so forth. People who stole hubcaps, cheated on their income tax, lied about their golf score, or stole gasoline out of cars would be considered only a little bit sick, perhaps uh, about like having a cold. Of course, all of the prisons and jails would either have to be torn down or converted into hospitals and health spas. If a bank were being robbed, instead of sending out a squad car full of cops, they would send out an ambulance full of doctors and nurses to administer to the sick people doing the robbing and the killing, as all the people that we used to refer to as criminals would now be called patients. Well, we haven't gone that far yet, have we? But we've started down the road. It's comforting, of course, temporarily, to think of wickedness as only a fairy tale something we don't have to do anything about, something that demands no responsibility on our part. But friend, does that attitude heal our guilt? Can we really deal with the sin problem effectively by refusing to recognize it as sin, by calling it something else, by considering its perpetrators as simply the innocent victims of an environment created by not by choice, but by chance. Listen, Jesus said to one lawbreaker in John 8, verse 11, he said, Go and sin no more. And to another one he said, John 5, verse 14, he said, Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. 
Evidently, Jesus thought there was such a thing as sin, and evidently he thought a man could choose whether to sin or not. He thought it was possible, in other words, to stop sinning. And on one occasion, when a sick man was brought into his presence, what was the first thing he said to him? Listen, Matthew 9, verse 2, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Imagine. And he came because he was ill. Evidently, Jesus knew that guilt, the guilt that makes a man sick, that keeps him awake at night, that haunts him all through his life. Jesus knew that guilt cannot be stamped out by ignoring it, by ridiculing it, or trying to talk it to death. Jesus, who had created man in the first place, you and me, he knew that guilt could be healed only by forgiveness. There's no other way. But why, we ask, did Jesus obviously like the bad people of his time and condemn the so-called good people of his day? Was he soft on sin? Something happened one day in the life of Jesus that will answer our question. Something happened that demonstrates how he felt and still feels about sin and about sinners. Early one morning, as he was teaching in the temple, he was rudely interrupted by a group of Pharisees and scribes who approached him pompously. They were dragging with them a terror-stricken woman whom they loudly accused of breaking the seventh commandment. She'd been taken in the very act of adultery, they said. And then with a hypocritical show of respect, they asked what should be done with her. Should she be stoned as provided in the law of Moses? Now, Jesus was not fooled by their pretended, re pretended reverence. He read their hearts. He knew why they'd come. He knew that belief there, beneath their show of respect was a deep laid plot for his ruin. And he knew that they themselves had led the woman into sin for the express purpose of laying a trap for him. You see, it was true that the law of Moses specified that certain offenses should be punished by stoning. But Israel was no longer a theocracy, you see. It was no longer an economy ruled directly by God. It was now under Roman rule. And the Romans didn't want the Jews fooling around with capital punishment. So the enemies of Jesus thought they had him trapped. If he should acquit the woman, they were accusing him of speaking against the law of Moses. And if he should say that the woman should be stoned, he'd be in trouble with Rome. They would see to that. So what did Jesus do? Listen, giving no sign that he even heard their question, he stooped down and began to write in the dust. Impatient at his delay and annoyed by his apparent indifference to them, the accusers moved nearer and urged that he answer their question. But then their eyes followed his to the pavement at his feet, where he had been writing there, traced before them, with the guilty secrets of their own lives. Their faces could scarcely conceal their terror. The people were moving forward to see what they found so disturbing. What if they should see what Jesus had written? What if they should be exposed before the people as frauds and the hypocrites they were? They'd appeal to the law of Moses. So Jesus would meet them on their own ground. And the law specified that witnesses in the case be the first to cast the stone. So rising and fixing his eyes on the scheming elders, he said simply, at the eighth chapter of John and the seventh verse, the eighth chapter of John and the seventh verse, he said, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And he stopped. Down again he went and continued his writing. For a moment they stood guilty and condemned in the presence of divine purity. And then silently, one by one, they bowed their heads and with downcast eyes they slipped away, leaving Jesus alone with the accused woman. Now, all this time, she'd stood before Jesus, simply cowering with fear. 
she dared not look into his face. And when she heard his words about casting the first stone, she took them as a death sentence. Silently and tremblingly, she awaited the first stone. And then, astonished, she saw her accusers depart. Speechless, confounded at what Jesus had done. And then she heard the Savior's words of hope, right here in the same chapter, the eighth verse, verses 10 and 11. Woman, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Is it any wonder that her heart was melted? Is it any wonder that she cast herself at the feet of Jesus and confessed her sins with bitter tears? Is it any wonder that this for her was the beginning of a new life? Now tell me, tell me, was Jesus soft on sin? Hardly. Not when he told her to go and sin no more. Had he condoned adultery? Not at all. But why didn't he then condemn her for what she'd done? He didn't need to, my friend. She had condemned herself. Her heart was already so full of guilt that it couldn't have held any more. But it was not so with her accusers. They acknowledged no guilt. They admitted no need. And Jesus loved them. He came to save them too, to die for them too. But he couldn't penetrate the barriers of pride and hypocrisy. Jesus had only kind words for the repentant sinner. He had words of hope for those whose guilt had stifled their hope. He had forgiveness for everyone who wanted it. But he called the proud Pharisees blind guides, whited sepulchers, and hypocrites, and told the people not to be like them. Now, true, there were tears in his voice as he spoke his scathing rebukes. Now, we can't see those tears on the printed page, you understand. Set down in printer's ink, his words appear more harsh than they were. But we still cannot escape the conclusion that Jesus considered pride and hypocrisy worse than adultery. Not that he condoned adultery, you understand. But he knew that pride and hypocrisy and self and cruel criticism, criticism were worse, often hopeless. Many a man's reputation has been ruined for life by adultery or murder. But there is hope for the worst of sinners who will confess his sin. It's the proud man who, man who feels no need. He's the one God can't reach. He's the one for whom there's no hope. If Jesus considered sins of pride worse than sins of the flesh, don't you think we ought to consider them worse too? But what man has ever been sent to jail for selfishness or pride or accusing his neighbor? Neighbor, how would we personally fare under such a program? If today we were publicly judged by Jesus' evaluation of sin instead of society's, where would we be? Oh, friend, as we watch our Lord's dealing with sinners of all kinds, we can only conclude that our greatest sin is our inhumanity to our fellow men. And we're cruelest, not with Saturday night specials, or with a gas chamber, or even with a bomb. We're cruelest with the tongue. We need to take a new look at sin, not ourselves. When we do that, we will be so busy rushing to Christ for forgiveness that we'll have no time or inclination to condemn anyone else. And we need to take another look at the incredible compassion of Jesus, because that's what my subject is about today. Loving, listening, caring, identifying, understanding, hearing, and feeling the silent inner cry of every man, woman, and child. Loving with no strings attached. Healing lepers that he knew would never return to thank him. Washing the feet of one who would betray him. Forgiving the men who drove the nails. Dying for the corrupt officials who'd sent him to the cross. For the soldiers who played games on the pavement at his feet. For the friends who forsook him and fled. Truly, he was a friend of sinners. 
When Jesus became a man to live as a man, it's not a place of clever strategy. It's not a tactical maneuver aimed at winning the worship of men. It was love pouring itself out without reserve, because love could do no less. He came to bring good news to the poor, to give sight to the blind, to free the captives of sin. He came to live as we must live, to be tempted as we're tempted. He came to rejoice with us and to hurt with us, and to share our guilt and to, f and to feel our sorrow until he was crushed by it. He was gentle with those who were weak, tender with those who were slow. He spoke the truth kindly but unwaveringly, and then waited for the light in the eyes that signal truth had found a home. He pointed his finger straight at sin and stated the alternatives with uncompromising honesty, but he respected every man's right to choose and left the sinner's dignity intact. We come when he came down to save us. He came all the way down. He wanted to be sure the ladder was long enough. He died as a sacrifice for the whole world, though he knew that comparatively few would accept that sacrifice. He provided salvation sufficient for all. He wanted to be sure there was enough. There was enough for the proud Pharisees, even those who dragged the terrified woman into the presence of Jesus. They could have felt his compassion, too, if only they were willing. Listen, there was not a one of those men who had not felt drawn to the Savior. They had heard the Spirit's voice to their own hearts, telling them that he was the true Messiah and urging them to acknowledge him as their Lord. But they publicly rejected him. It would be too humiliating to turn back from the path of rebellion. They were too proud to confess their error. They didn't have to slip away, confounded, defeated that day. They could have knelt beside the woman and confessed their own sins with bitter tears. There was forgiveness enough for them, too. What a, what a prayer meeting it would have been. The angels would have shouted for joy. But, my friend, forgiveness is for those who ask it. I wish it were possible in some way to help each of you viewing just now to see how completely Jesus identifies with you personally, how completely he understands your situation and your need. Let me tell you a little story. David Schenck, missionary to Belgium, was invited to speak to a small group of foreign miners, Greek, Spanish, Yugoslavian workers, he had only minutes to prepare, and what could he say to men with their background, hardened as they were by rough living, and bitterness, and propaganda? Risking everything on an impression, he stripped off his coat and tie to better identify, and followed his translator into the meeting room. Look, fellows, he said, would you agree to play a game with me? Let me try to tell you about yourselves. If I'm wrong, you stop me. But as long as I tell you the truth about you, I may go on. Agreed? Well, they all nodded a cautious agreement and leaned back to listen. None of you men, he began, has ever had a real opportunity to get ahead in life until now. And so, for once in your lives, you're risking your very existence by going down into those dirty, dusty Belgium mines in order that your children won't have to go through what you've gone through until now. Is that right? Yes, that's right. They said, go on. So then you work hard day after day, almost batting your brains out down there in the mine so that your kids won't have to. That's your ideal. And when you get your pay on Saturday, you go down to the cafe, drink up a good part of your pay, gamble some of it, spend a part of it foolishly, wasting your time so that when you get home, with the rest of your pay to give to your wife, she looks at you and tells you that there's not enough money for the week. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Go on. So he continued, because of your wife's criticism, which was perfectly in order, you get mad at her, slap her, right? Right, but how did you know? 
but he went right on. After you've slapped your wife, you go off in a corner somewhere by yourself and become really ashamed of what you've done. And you ask, why did I do it? I didn't really want to do that to someone I love. Why did I do it? Correct? Yes, that's about the way that it is. David Schenck went on to describe their guilt, how they got mad at themselves, mad at their wives, mad at the kids, and then they determined that things would be different. They'd go down to the mine again and get to thinking about how they'd mess things up. What if there should be a cave-in or an explosion? What would happen to them if they should die? And they wish they could talk to somebody about it. But who could help? They're all in the same situation. And they said, where did you get to know this about us? <laughs> he said, I got it out of this book. It's written right here in this book. Do you want me to tell you of what the rest of the book says? And they said, yes, tell us the rest. Oh, friend, you may not be a minor, but how much revision would that story take to fit your situation? God's book may not describe your problem or that of the minor in quite that detail, but it fits. It has the answer. It has the answer because it's all about a man who himself is the answer to all of your need. Yes, whoever you are, wherever you are, whatever your problem, however deep your guilt, however impossible it may seem that anyone, even God, could help, yet he can. He himself is the answer, and he's calling you, drawing you, inviting you now to make his acquaintance. Please do it, friend, as you listen to this. Am I waking from dreams like a child in the night? Am I turning from wrong and embracing the right? Am I moving from darkness into the light? Is that why there are tears in my eyes? What a fool I have been to have lived all along as a rule I have lived. Thank you, Marilyn Cotton. Shall we pray? Thank you, God, for the compassionate Jesus. Nothing short of this can break a hard, selfish heart and leave him compassionate. 
We confess our greatest sin, man's inhumanity to man. Change us, Lord, make us kind, make us sensitive. Who condemns us? No one, Lord, and then we hear those words, go and sin no more. Help us to forgive ourselves as we forgive others, and find the peace and joy of a forgiven and cleansed life, born again by the power of God, made happy by forgiveness and compassion through the example of Jesus. It's in his name that we ask it. Amen. Hello, I'm Lonnie Meloshenko. I have faith to believe that many of you during this last half hour have made the decision to accept the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and you're wondering just how to proceed. Many others of you, I'm sure, want to renew and strengthen your relationship with your Lord. Our gift for you today will give you just the help you need. It's Pastor Vandeman's book, How to Live with a Tiger, and we'll tell you in a moment how to ask for your copy. How to Live with a Tiger how to come to Christ, how to be a Christian, how to have victory over the tiger inside that seems to be just too much for you. Also, you'll want the book because it contains the story of Pastor Vandeman's own encounter with the claims of Christ. Ask for the book by name, How to Live with a Tiger, and we'll get it into the mail right away. And now, here is the information you need. You may request Pastor Vandeman's free offer by writing directly to It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. The offer is sent by mail free and postpaid. Our address is easy to remember. Just It Is Written, Box O, that's Box Zero, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Please be sure to ask for the offer by name. It takes only a few moments to write, but it could mean a lifetime of satisfaction. While you're writing down the address, let me remind you to invite a friend to watch It Is Written with you next week on this station. The address again is It Is Written, Box O, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Remember, our offer for you today is Pastor Vandeman's book, How to Live with a Tiger. That's How to Live with a Tiger. Ask for it. And now, here again is Pastor Vandeman. Thank you, Lonnie. Now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God.